Before I say anything, I want to hear just the opening phrase of Spirit, which would be quite the in your ears in case the explosion in your ears on your way here. I've said a lot about Debussy, and you probably know a fair amount. And I want to get back to that famous lesson that he had with a man named Giroud, where Debussy, as a young man, played a strange chord progression, which sounded like Debussy, probably like this. We don't know, but something like that. And we know what Giro said, and I'll tell you why in a minute. He said, that's beautiful, but there's no theory to explain it. So you really can't <laughs> do that. It seems funny now, but it would be like a poet showing his teacher, or who, let's say in a, in a writing class, something that seemed interesting to say, but seemed to mean nothing in particular, and say, well, those are a beautiful string of words, and it has a nice rhythm, but I don't understand what it means, and that's not how we use the language. That's basically what it was like. But I, I think I need to say a few things about Giro. We primarily know him for being Debussy's teacher, but he also, you know him another way. He wrote the recitatives for Carmen. <laughs> You might have thought Bizet did that, but Bizet didn't do that. He wrote the arias, and he left it as dialogue. And very often now it is done with spoken dialogue. And the recitatives are sometimes done. But for a very long time, there were singing recitatives with orchestra. And they were all written by Giro. So he had written 11 operas. He was quite popular. And by the time he was Debussy's teacher, he was a very respected guy. So I thought. Before we get back into Debussy, let's hear a little bit of music by Giro. So I'm going to play something for you. <clears throat> so you can see the huge sea change from this teacher to this student. By the way, um, all of the comments that the teachers at the Paris Conservatory wrote about all the students are available. Everything is now. So I, I read them the other day. And um, one of the interesting ones, it, it was a lot of reading to find an interesting one. Uh, and it's very short, too. <laughs> and all it, it's Giro writing about Debussy, though, and he says, very intelligent, but needs to be bridled. <laughs> Isn't that, it's perfect. Okay. <clears throat> By the way, Debussy had no schooling until he was 10 years old, and his only schooling was the Paris Conservatory. That's why he was so brilliant. <laughs> Um, in other words, he, he saw everything afresh. So here's a little bit of music by his teacher, Giro. It's supposed to be cello and piano, but I'll just play it for you.
Okay, et cetera. Now, it's very, very straightforward. Uh, I don't know anyone who plays that now, although it's nice. Might be a nice on. It goes on. Very, very square. And it does certain things that are so correct as to be wrong. <laughs> no, but I mean, uh, it takes a very long time to get off these two chords. But then when he does a, a fresh chord, it's very French. And all the high notes are accompanied with new harmonies, and then it changes key just when it should after it's established, all these things. So this is Debussy's teacher. <clears throat> Debussy basically dislocated the grammar of music. He took the vocabulary out, he ignored the grammar, and he collected the sounds of music that interested him. In other words, there's a chord here in a piece by Giraud. To Debussy, that's not a chord in a progression, it's just a sonority to collect. This happens to be a ninth chord, and I, I'm going to, um, I think I'm going to insist that everyone recognize ninth chords by the end of the, uh, <laughs> it's really easy. One, three, five, seven, nine. So if you take the octave, that's eight, one more note, that's nine, and you let it sit there. In, in Giro, of course, it resolves immediately. There's the ninth resolving. But of course, you know, this is o over 100 years old, this piece, and people would be thrilled. <laughs> you know, it's just exactly what you want, you know. But Debussy never wanted to write exactly what anybody wanted. He, he just wanted to collect these sounds and reorganize them and have a fresh world because he felt that music had become too full of rules. You could see why he thought that at the Paris Conservatory. In fact, there were two conservatories, the, the um, Scola Cantorum and the Paris Conservatory in Paris, arguing like, about everything. The faculties hated each other. Uh, they called these the little wars between these faculties, which is very common in France, <clears throat> even now. And they would argue about everything. And then when Debussy had his first success, Pelias and Melisande, he had a group of people who called themselves the Debussyites. And they were devoted to him, like he was a guru, which is understandable. And then when he tried something new, they hated him because <laughs> he tried something new. So this went on forever. Now, what I'd like to do is take a look at Syrinx, this piece, in real detail, because here you have a, a piece of music for one solo line, which incorporates a lot of Debussy's most imaginative ways of thinking. Just this solo line, which is interesting because among the criticisms there were of Debussy was that, I mean, even the people who criticized him a lot admitted that he had a fresh approach and new ideas and changed everything in the, in the whole scope of how music was written. But they would say, well, he only affected harmony. He did nothing to melody. In fact, he never wrote a melody, and he doesn't know how to write a melody. That was a big complaint. So <clears throat> let's take a look at this melodic line for a moment. And you have, you have a page, not the uh, tasting menu. We'll get right back to that. <clears throat> it looks very complicated, even to me, <laughs> but it, it isn't. And remember, if you read music, this is very helpful. If you don't, it's OK. There are a lot of words. And the, the shapes of the notes and the things will be very helpful. Um, <clears throat> you know that syrinx, or syrinx, which for some reason in France they can't pronounce anything correctly. Um, <laughs> but syrinx refers to um, the nymph who, uh, not uh, the story of a nymph running away from Pan and then at the last moment, she calls out to the water nymphs to save her from Pan, and uh, they turn her into a reed. And then Pan picks up the reed, and he makes his Pan pipes so that he still has her. And she is the, one of the pipes. She's one of the reeds. And of course, Syrinx is also the voice box of a, of a bird, which uh, I'll add to this is, um, unlike a flute, a Bird's syrinx can s s do two sounds at once. I mean, you can do two sounds at once if you really want to. But it's not natural to the flute. Um, I shouldn't say that. 
It's completely natural to the flute, but it's, nobody writes that way except for very recently. So, in other words, you can get two tones, if you're a bird, from your syrinx, and that's why birds can do all these strange things. But here it's just syrinx. Now, Debussy collected musical thoughts, ideas, vocabulary, phrases from everywhere. Instead of taking the tradition of composition, which he knew very well, and he even won the Prix de Rome, and he won a second prize, and then he won a first prize, which is a very serious uh, prize for young composers, which Ravel never won, he tried. All sorts of famous people that no one ever heard of won it. Um, <clears throat> just like all, all, prize, all prizes are like that. There are long, long, you, six people you heard of, and then hundreds of people you didn't, it's fine. But he at least knew enough about what they wanted in the conservatory to obey all the rules and, as a young man, write something they thought was an absolutely perfect example of what they thought he should be doing. So, here you have a whole tone scale, which is very important to Debussy. He learned the whole tone scale from Liszt, not personally, <laughs> from listening to Liszt and from, there's even the whole tone scale in late Schubert, but also from hearing the gamelan, uh, that came to the uh, World's Fair in Paris at the beginning of the century, of the last century. So here is a whole tone scale. There are no, ha these are half steps. None of those. Half step. They're all, so there are only six whole tones in a whole tone scale before you start over. And then if you transpose it once, <clears throat> that's all you can do. In other words, if you take a major scale, you can transpose it many times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, twelve notes. Twelve different major scales. The whole tone scale, there are only two. <clears throat> They're a half step apart, and they cover all the whole tones in half steps. So, is that a limitation? Messian called the whole tone scale uh, a mode of limited transposition, and he used many such modes. Um, by limited, it simply means less than 12. You can't duplicate it or replicate it on every single pitch. So it's not really a limitation. It's just a fact of the scale, and it has some nice parts about it, because if you transpose it once, you're done. <laughs> In other words, it, it doesn't have the ongoing aspect of transposition that's part of tonal music. For example, if I do this. These are transpositions. I can skip around. But with a whole tone scale, I'm done. <laughs> uh, in other words, it, it really limits you, but it changes your focus away from key change, because you're not in a key anyway. You can't be. You can't even do this in a whole tone scale, because you have no perfect fifths. That interval does not exist. The violin, which is tuned to perfect fifths, I guess if you only played whole tone music, you'd have to redo that. You know, uh, like that. Tune your violin that way, make it a lot easier. <clears throat> So there you have at the beginning the two whole tone scales, and underneath it, but it's the same thing written with different, instead of flat sharps, that's all. So you have whole tone scale, and underneath it the same thing with F sharps instead of G flat, and then the other one. Now, this is already enough to understand what he's doing at the opening of Syrinx. He's doing something nobody did before. He's interlocking two whole tone scales. Uh, the opening phrase, which you see right there, if you can look where there's a little bracket, the top whole tone scale on the beat is, and then off the beat is, we're missing a note, but that's okay. So the whole tone scale consists of two whole tone scales, the, the two whole tone scales interlocking. One is on the beat, one is off the beat. Does he want you to know this? No. 
It's just a new way of thinking. Well, why doesn't he just write any old note he wants? He is. That's what he wants. <laughs> He's, but he doesn't want disorder. Now, he was accused of being an anarchist, a musical anarchist, uh, in the paper. Of course, it's, it wasn't a legal accusation, although it will be in one of his children's concerts coming up. He has to go to court to defend himself. But um, <clears throat> he would have loved that. <laughs> but anyway, so then... You see the little X? That's because he skips a note from one of the whole tone scales. There's no E flat. So you get this motif, which you can recognize, because it's the only place that skips a note. Now, if we call it X, we'll see it all over the place. And there are two versions of it, and the opposite. So the half step, if you think of this as a major third, you'd be right, because it is a major third. OK, <laughs> there's a major third. A half step down from the top, we have a half step because we've got two interlocking whole tone scales with a note missing. So if we put that half step on the bottom, then we get the inversion of it. Did Debussy think of this? Probably it's there. So, most likely. Now, the question always is, does, is, somebody, is someone like Debussy thinking in analytical terms or just by sound? My feeling is that it's sound only after, though, lots of investigation and thought, which makes this second nature. Just like when you and I talk in a conversation. Well, I'll speak for myself. <laughs> when people talk in conversation, you don't have to plan out what you're going to say, just as I'm not planning out even the end of this fragment. No, but sentence is what I meant. The end of this, you know, caboose. Um, <clears throat> but we don't say absurd things. We say pretty much uh, what we, I'm sure somebody's thinking they do say, but you're thinking of your mother-in-law or somebody says absurd things. OK, basically, we don't say absurd things. We say pretty much what we need to say. And we don't need to think about the grammar. We don't need to think in advance. We, don't have, we can be spontaneous with our language. And every composer works in a language, uh, a mature composer, works in a language which is able to function in that spontaneous way. So even a new language that Debussy is completely uh, inventing himself, he's going to study, he's going to think about it, he'll, he will take his two whole tone scales and get an idea about interlocking them in a melody. And then things will evolve beautifully. So he could think about it both somewhat analytically and completely in sound, and they become fused, they, the same thing. So here we go. In, in other words, I mention this because very often people attack new music or old new music like Schoenberg, sometimes even Debussy, as being so-called cerebral. Where else can you think of it? I'd like to know. OK, so <clears throat> but what I mean by cerebral <laughs> is the idea that it's all thought process. It's not felt. It's not evolved from emotion. But it is all one thing. So here, in fact, Debussy, oh boy, do I interrupt myself a lot. <laughs> Who else can I interrupt during a lecture? Nobody. So, so, so Debussy said music is not about emotion. It is emotion. I don't know if he's right about that, but it's a nice thought. Now, the, there's a note missing from that, and there's an also a uh, there's a C missing, as well as the E flat. So the C comes in right here. Now, why is that important? Well, you, more and more in, in uh, Debussy's music, but in all music, you will notice a um, tendency for composers to be aware of the notes that are not being used because those have fresh value. It's like a key change. But he's not in a key. So since he's not in a key, he has to be aware by ear or by thought same thing, be aware of what notes have not been used so that they can have some power. Now, I pointed out that the E flat here is missing. Well, I'll put it in. It doesn't really work. But anyway, of course it doesn't. Now, moving on, where it says number 12, 1, 2, 3, 4, it says chromatic upper voice. It says X inverted. You could also just listen if you don't like looking at that. It's fine. There's X inverted. It's this.
And there it is, there's X. And the high note of the phrase is the missing E flat. Now, even though some of you reacted in a beautiful way because I said it, you reacted, believe me, before when she played it anyway, without knowing that. So why come to a lecture? That's, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's, it's interesting to talk about it, at least for, uh, I, I always find that I learn something doing this. So maybe what you're finding out from that thought is that that E flat that arrives is not just high. It is expected, it's anticipated, it's been left out, and it arrives. It's exactly, you know, he sets up suspense, a kind of suspense that you're unaware of. It's a suspense that results from not saturating the music with all the notes, as some composers later do, or simultaneously, like Schoenberg, who likes to saturate the palette. One of the reasons that, prob probably the reason, that Schoenberg is hard for a lot of people to listen to is that the phrases are saturated with all the pitches all the time. So you don't have missing notes that you can wait for. Um, that is this, you know, a very hard thing to deal with. Um, Debussy never does that, and he uses, if he, if he uses tradition, he uses the, the old fundamental concept that saving important notes for important places will give you emotional resonance and some satisfaction. All right, then what happens, this is now, it says bar 17. We've already heard this. What's he, what, he do, what he's doing is he saves the third beat. It's like he's constructing a little um, symmetry here, and the third beat of each bar changes, and then we go into what essentially sounds like pentatonic music. It isn't strictly pentatonic. What is pentatonic? I'll get to that, but it means five, a five-note group, a five-note scale, and I'll get back to that. It's the most famous, most used, and overused scale uh, there is. Oh, sorry. So here <clears throat> we get to it where it says exotic versus traditional modes and scales. And they, oh, there's the pentatonic scale right there. <laughs> now this little F that's at the top takes you out of it. But it's right at the top. So he, it, it's, it makes it sound more uh, Dorian, more of an old mode. Does he care which mode it is? As long as he's not writing in a traditional framework, he's very happy. Because first of all, Pan, the Greek god Pan is not, you know what, let's play this without the accidentals. Let's see what would happen if the Greek god Pan was not written by Debussy, but was written by Giro. Let's just try, so don't play any accidentals. We'll play up until, uh, until there. Okay. I'll, I'll do Giro harmonies kind of thing. <laughs> Not bad. I mean, uh, of course, I was doing little Debussy-esque piano parts. Let's do it a little bit straighter one more time, and then we'll go back to the real music. <clears throat> I'll get Alan Gilbert. I'll, he'll be right over. Okay, so if, have a seat. We'll get right back to that in just a moment. <laughs> so, so that was in a key. Did you see how it's still lovely? And there's nothing. There was nothing stopping Debussy from doing that. Uh, moving along. Uh, I believe you have that too, right? Yes, the top of the second page. When it gets to the low point there, that's X.
And this, the outline of this are all tritones. Now, a tritone is simply, um, it's not simply anything, it's pretty complicated. Uh, a tritone divides the chromatic scale in half. It means three whole tones. So obviously, a tritone is part of the whole tone scale in a big way. And he, he connects it with little chromatic notes. But in the whole tone scale, you have a tritone from every note. In other words, every note in that scale has a tritone against it from some other note in that scale. That is very different from a major scale, which has one tritone. Right? If I do fourths, that's it. Um, the tr and also, um, that's the tritone also. The tritone, <clears throat> and also this. Okay. The, <laughs> the tritone, <clears throat> the tritone is uh, in used by Bernstein to cause trouble because it has always. It was called the devil in music in, in the Middle Ages by the church. Who else would call it? <laughs> Who else? Maybe, maybe uh, uh, a Tea Party candidate would, would possibly. <clears throat> I'm sure that we're in danger of having tritones banned now. But do you think that's funny? They were banned in the Middle Ages by the church. Composers who wrote for the church could not write that interval. It changed the history of music. Um, the pentatonic scale, which you see over there where it says pentatonic, the most popular scale, and by that I mean most folk music, not only of the Western world, but of the Eastern world, most folk music is pentatonic. It has no tritones. And it wasn't banned by anybody. <laughs> it's just that a tritone causes trouble and is harder to improvise with. And you need to have harmony and organization. If you have a pentatonic scale, the, the, the black keys are, are pentatonic scale, for example. You can't go wrong. Everything's going to sound fine. Uh, there's a lot of uh, folk music. That's nothing in particular. Uh, <laughs> is that Chinese or is that Appalachian? <laughs> it's, I call it, that's the mode I, you, some of you know, I call the Sino-Appalachian mode. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but anyway, so what Debussy is doing is taking the two modes that are as polar opposite as possible. The pentatonic, non-tritone scale, the safest, it's very beautiful. A beautiful, safe harmonically, improvisatory friendly mode, improvisational friendly mode, and the whole tone scale, which is extremely dissonant. There's no major or minor chord in a whole tone scale. They're all augmented. Now that doesn't mean he can't write a major or minor by using something from somewhere else. But if you stick to the whole tone scale, Transpose it, and then go to pentatonic. Those two things are very far apart. So by putting them together, he's created a strange world. Um, and there's no system for using them together. And he never developed a system because he hated systems. Um, he was really against it. So then, if we move forward a little bit, if you, let's see, if we look at bar, where it says 29, this is the third line down on that page, towards the end. That little thing at the very end of that line. This is a whole tone situation, even though there's a little half step here, little, two half steps. But the outside, the triad, the, the um, structure, the skeleton of that, beat is an augmented triad, which means it's 
coming from whole tones. So of course Debussy allows himself to use half steps connecting as connective tissue. Basically this is a whole tone piece with half steps connecting the whole tone, like the muscles are whole tone, is that right? And the sinews, no, the, well, let's put it this way, the parts of the brain are whole tone and the neural networks are um, <laughs> half steps. So at the very end, we get a finally, a completely pure whole tone scale to disappear. He's been wanting it the whole time, right? And you finally get it. All right, I think we are more prepared than any audience in history to hear this flute solo. <laughs> Shall we hear it? Okay. Hello. Almost any book on WC, you encounter the word impressionism. Here are some words for you impressionism, symbolism, Baroque, Ashcan school. <laughs> what do they have in common? They were all negative criticisms that became the words that were then accepted. Even Baroque, I'm sure you know that. The Baroque, I mean, we can still use the word to mean what it's originally meant, like an ornate pearl, an over-ornate, over-developed, too elaborate, to, a little too baroque, oh. But uh, then it became, from its negative connotations, it became accepted as a word. And now, for many people, it means a time in music where none of those people ever heard that word. Well, that's not true. It, some of them eventually did. <laughs> uh, and the same is true of Impressionism, which was a criticism. I have, in case you, of course, you could look this up on your phone in your pocket, but um, 
Yes, it was first used in a Paris journal called Charivari, April 25th, 1874, by Louis Leroy, who was criticizing Sunrise by Monet, and Sunrise by Monet, the painting, was subtitled An Impression. So he ripped into that. That's what critics, they still do that. They look for a word. Because writing about the painting is, is hard. So there's a word, impression. This is an impression? I don't think so. So then, uh, that's d direct translation. So um, Debussy hated the word impression, ism, because, first of all, he hated isms, because he was trying to create something fresh and new and personal. But beyond that, it was a negative word at the time. Symbolism, he somewhat, he didn't really like that either, he's somewhat more comfortable with because the symbolist poets were inspirational to him. Baudelaire and the American Edgar Allan Poe. People who wrote supposedly uh, uh, symbols instead of realities, uh, this is complicated, um, and who dealt with dreams and images of dreams and images of symbols rather than writing about reality. But Debussy himself wrote that he wasn't trying to create an impression of anything. He was writing new realities. That's a great letter. And who's to say they weren't? I mean, they are new realities now, and they, I guess they were then. Um, and the symbols. I don't want to get into this too much, but the symbols, aren't they real symbols? OK, anyway, getting away from that. <laughs> so let's take a look at the vocabulary. That's the tasting menu, the vocabulary that Debussy took from the things around him and changed by divorcing these things from their grammar, destroying previous syntax. So of course, the people who were upset at the conservatory, Giraud, who thought he should be bridled, but he hadn't even written any of this music yet, he was a student. Um, they, they were right to be upset because he was destroying, in a way, what they knew how to do and what meant something to them. And they didn't know, understand what he was doing. Um, it took, and you know, like a lot of people, Debussy was a composer, like a lot of composers, was attacked relentlessly before he was accepted. And there was, a, as I said, there was a group of Debussyists, but a lot of people were very upset. So let's take a look at these scales in the tasting menu. You have the major scale. They have no stems. So I hope that doesn't bother you. <laughs> the natural minor. I played it differently too. Instead of, I'm going to give them moods. The whole tone scale. Now I started each one on C. They're all the same notes with alterations, so that you can, even if you don't read music, you can see they're all. If you look at the major scale with no sharps, no flats, these are all permutations, if you will, of those same notes. You can only have six of those for the whole tone scale. Pentatonic. You'll notice we skip two notes, the E and the B. We skip one, two, three is missing, four, five, six, seven is missing, one, two. You could also take the bottom note and put it on the top, and then you get a different feeling than this. This is more major. This is more minor. Right next to it, I give you the, pent uh, the next line, the pentatonic minor. It's the same thing, but I put them all on C. So you can go home and make a chart. Uh, if you do that, I really like <coughs> not to know about that. <laughs> okay, then the octatonic scale. How did that get in there? <clears throat> the octatonic scale emerged, even though there are little intimations of it in Liszt. I keep mentioning Liszt because even though he primarily was a virtuoso and his music tends to be about showing off keyboard technique, he had some great harmonic ideas that were very innovative. Liszt, Schubert, late Schubert, he only lived to be 31, so between 28 and 31, late Schubert, some very interesting things started to creep up. Not that scale, but some chord progressions that seemed to relate to it. But it really came into its own in Russia with Rimsky-Korsakov. And it became something everyone knew about through Stravinsky. And Stravinsky, of course, never told anyone where he got it, because if they couldn't tell it came from other Russian composers, that's their problem. 
And it took, it took uh, years until um, it was discovered that it was taught to him in a class. Um, so here. Octatonic is an eight note scale. Everything has been seven or five. And just so you know, it consists of uh, alternating whole steps and half steps. As opposed to all whole tones. I mean, if you think, how can you tell? If you take uh, Old MacDonald, in a whole tone scale, you can't play that. You know, it's quite different. Uh, in the octatonic scale, it would also be difficult. Um, I'm trying to get as close as I can to it. <laughs> the Dorian scale, very old mode. Lydian, also very old. old. It's the same as major with a sharp four. Mixolydian is like major with a lowered seventh. One, two, three, four, five, six. And then you have the chords. Now, you don't need to know these scales, so why am I telling you? Maybe you do, I don't know. But if you come to a lecture, you gotta learn stuff, <laughs> okay? So that's one thing. Uh, so I ha but the other thing is that the whole concept of how these modes, these scales, are used to organize thought is really a big deal. If you studied an instrument as a kid and you practiced scales all the time, you may not have ever made the connection between the scales and the music. Maybe you did. Maybe you heard some pieces where the scales were going up and down. But that's not what they really do. They generate the harmonies. They generate the melodic lines. They create the textures that are possible and basically everything that is possible. And what Debussy did was jettison the most traditional scales of France at that time and Europe at that time and bring in something Asian, two Asian modes actually, whole tone and pentatonic, even though they were floating around in Europe. And they were also floating around heavily in Russia. For some reason, and we know the reason, a lot of interesting things happened uh, musically in Russia in the late 19th, early 20th century, it's because they were so isolated from Europe. So things were different, it's like a different dialect so, of music. Now come the chords. One of those chords might have made you think of Jerome Kern or Gershwin right away. That's fine. Uh, we're going to get to Gershwin. He was very, very influenced by France. But basically, if you take your, your standard major chord, which you can find on, on almost any instrument that has strings, and you add a seven, this is a standard harmony. Then if you keep going by thirds, that's your ninth. And if I do nine, 11, and then 13, I now have all seven notes of the scale organized as thirds. Debussy never really used that that way, but Copland did. And we'll get, we'll get to Copland, like dividing the scale up into blocks of chords and separate, separating them. But where the 13th chord is, you see a note missing? The 11th is missing because the 11th makes it very saturated and dissonant. So that was too much for Debussy. So he left, usually left it out. And where does it resolve? But to that very missing note, if you're in a key. All right? Now, if you flat that 13th, then you're gonna to wanna to leave out the fifth because that dissonance, I mean, you might like it, but it's a dissonance that is sort of counterproductive to what you're, you're building this resonance uh, structure. And that dissonance makes the resonance uh, less stable. And so you want it to, to ring. Underneath the flat 13th, you see I wrote you a note. I'm not sure which one of you has this on your paper, but the lucky one. It says, if you leave out the fifth, and the word the is missing, that's supposed to be humorous. If you leave out fifth, it is, and uh is missing, a whole, it, no, it's no, it is whole tone related. In other words, you know this does not come from the whole tone scale. Debussy, I'm sure, heard this because he used it all the time. If you leave this out and this, 
then you've got a whole tone scale chord, which also relates to tonality. It's a common pivot. Pivots are very important to a composer. He's got a chord that can be found in the whole tone scale, and a chord that can be found in major and minor. That's unusual. So that's beautiful. I mean, you could do that simply with this, but this is better because it's richer, it's more resonant, it's more complex. Then you have your little augmented triad. So what Debussy did is divorce these things, as I said, from functionality. Now, if you heard a Debussy lecture of mine in the past, you know that I often compare them to different rooms in a, in a building. I'll, I'll do that quickly, but I have another one I want to try, which is probably something Debussy would have understood. <laughs> um, I sometimes say that you can take a chord that exists, let's say, in the kitchen. You know, each room of your apartment has a function. You have a kitchen, a bedroom, a bathroom, a living room. They have names that tell you what they're for. That's what harmony used to be like before Debussy. You have chords that have a purpose, and we know how to use them. We don't go into the, into the uh, bedroom to make lunch. Well, I, I know some people do. <laughs> That's not my point. Okay. And what Debussy did was, instead of using the different rooms, he would take one room, like this chord, I'll just use a simpler chord, and just move it up and down the kitchen line from the different floors of the building. They're all kitchens, so to speak. And you're not supposed to have a series of vertical kitchens. But that's basically what he did. Now, I still like that. That's why I told it to you again. But from Debussy's point of view, <clears throat> he was collecting these chords as separate objects. In other words, yes, you could think of them in some metaphor. But to him, each chord had its own value just as a harmony without being related to anything at all. That's why he can put them anywhere he wants and puts any chord next to any other chord, as long as it sounds good to him. A young composer studying not only today, but for the last 50 years, maybe a little longer, which they would all think that that's what you do. You put things together musically the way you want to. You just, what sounds good, that, of course it's what sounds good. But until Debussy made that point, that theory is, you know, he said the only thing that matters is pleasure, not theory. It was a new concept. Uh, Stravinsky, simultaneously, uh, did similar things. But Stravinsky had some systems he was working on. Schoenberg had a system that he developed. Scriabin had a system that he developed. Debussy thought, who needs a system? <laughs> That's really, now, that doesn't mean he didn't get rid of vocabulary. Now, he didn't have a system, but he wasn't exactly an anarchist because, uh, I mean, sounds dangerous, but because he did have tendencies, his taste was predictable after a while, so it might be possible for somebody to uh, go through all of Debussy's music and come up with a latent system or, you know, a subconscious system. That's fine. Uh, and I, I know, I, I'm sure I could do it because I imitate Debussy's music all the time, but I, that's not the point. It, it, he may have done that, but he wasn't consciously working with the system as the others were, definitely. So, <clears throat> I mean, for example, the Rite of Spring of Stravinsky, uh, which many people just say was, you know, uh, uh, just a wild torrent of sound. Anything that occurred to him, he did. And as Stravinsky said at the time, it was given to him by a higher power. And uh, Pache to my, my friend uh, Jonah Lehr Lehrer, who wrote a, a book called Proust, was a neuroscientist in which he talks about how Stravinsky's music was completely wild and unpredictable, and then we learned how to hear it because our brains adapt. The fact is it wasn't, it, it had a system. It, had, it was full, highly, highly organized music. People took a while to hear it. But The Rite of Spring is not written by ear only. It is an ear that is highly organized based on a whole series of presumptions that Stravinsky came up with. So um, <clears throat> getting back to this, the piece, en blanc et noir, which I'm going to say a little bit, we'll hear a little of it. We don't have two pianists today, so we'll hear some highlights and some ideas. This fits near the end of his life in a strange way, Debussy's life. 
Um, the war, World War I, took a real toll on everybody, of course. But uh, for Debussy, it, he stopped writing for a while. He also <coughs> developed colon cancer during that period. Uh, he died at 56, which is exactly how old I am. So if you want to know what Debussy, what he looked like, here I am. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but uh, he, he started to get interested in being French in a new way because of the war. He wrote letters about being French. He wrote anti-German letters at the same time as he, well, everybody was in France, at the same time as he didn't, he wrote a letter to the government of France saying we should not ban German music, which they were going to do. Mm -hmm. And he got other composers to sign that. On the other hand, in some of his private letters, he was considering that it might be a good thing. I'll read you a couple of things, and then we'll get to Au Blanc Noir is, is, a, is a war piece. It was written, during, it was written in 1915. It has <coughs> bugle calls. It has uh, Ein feste Burg ist unser, ist unser Gott, you know, uh, to be German, a, a mighty fortress is our God, appears to re represent the Germans. A very weird, almost incomprehensible, quote of the Marseillaise is there. And I would not even have noticed it except Debussy mentions it. And when you find it, you realize it's very weird. Um, so here are a few things that Debussy had to say about all this <clears throat> from his letters. For seven months now, music has been subordinated to the military regime. Although strictly confined to barracks or ordered out on charitable missions, she has in general suffered less from inactivity than from her mobilization. Today, when the virtues of our race, meaning French, which of course is not a race, but anyway. Today, when the virtues of our race are being exalted, the victory should give our artists a sense of purity and remind them of the nobility of the French blood. We have a whole intellectual province to recapture. That is why at a time when only fate can turn the page, talk about a page turner, and fate can turn the page, Music must bide her time and take stock of herself before breaking that dreadful silence which will remain after the last shell has been fired. Another from a letter, what, am I do what I am doing, meaning composing, seems so wretchedly small. I've got to the state of envying Satie, who is a corporal in the army and is really going to defend Paris. I believe that we shall pay dearly for the right not to love the art of Richard Strauss and Schoenberg. As for Beethoven, it has happily been discovered that he was Flemish. <laughs> <laughs> of course, there is the van, not the fun. You know, you, you, you know that the, Beethoven's name is V-A-N, not V-O-N. And Beethoven himself, this is another lecture, but really fast, Beethoven in print printed V-O-N a lot so that he would be mistaken for nobility. But it was a, a Dutch name. Uh, and when it was discovered, he got in a lot of trouble in, in court. Um, so during this period, I'll accept one more wonder, wonderful quote. This is a very simple thought, but I, I like having it in, in, in print to say. War is a state of mind contradictory to thought. That's it. I think it's an amazing quote. Now, here we have some music of Debussy where, unlike his other music, he actually is an Impressionist, unarguably or inarguably, depending on whether you're speaking French or English. Um, he is an Impressionist because he is taking musical objects, tunes from other people, and putting them in strange contexts, like a painter. Uh, an Impressionist painter is doing one thing that it's very hard for a musician to do. An impressionist painter is painting a cathedral, is painting the moon, is painting the, the landscape with an impression of how we see it or how the painter sees it. What is the composer making an impression of? Music is not normally an impression of a thing. So that's a very complicated situation. Yes, it may remind you of impressionism because it has an indistinct quality. It may feel like moonlight, especially if he puts clair de lune on it. <laughs> but if you put something else on it, you know, just éclair, it would sound like that too. <laughs> but um, he starts quoting things, bugle calls, just in a few pieces. 
First, I'll play you a little bit of a piece that no one ever plays anymore, except there are, unfortunately, performances of this occasionally. Uh, <laughs> Berceuse Héroïque, the heroic lullaby, which he dedicated to Belgium, the king of Belgium, Belgium. And it has the Belgian national anthem in it. So here's a little bit of it. It's, it's a very strange piece of music. I'm going to move forward in the quotes for time's sake. I can't believe it's Debussy if you know Debussy, but. Little bits of the Belgian national anthem. Um, in uh, Blanc et Noir, the second movement, whoops, this thing is very sensitive. Um, the second movement has a real war quality to it. And by the way, the, musically speaking, He's occasionally in, in a key, then he shifts to pentatonicism, then it's whole tones, then it's whatever he wants. He also does something that was really shocking to people at the time, which he would harmonize things in seconds. Uh, I don't mean really fast. <laughs> I mean, in, if you, in take this, this little melody. Here's a melody. Instead of thirds, he would do this. Or... If you do enough seconds, you have a whole tone scale. And sometimes the whole tone scale emerges. Um, now, to write seconds is not so strange. But at the time, of course, this was really bizarre. Here's some of this music where you will hear uh, a mighty fortress is our god, the sense of impending doom and battle, a little bit of what sounds like patriotic music, which cheapens it a little bit. And, uh, you know, patriotism is, is a very unartistic emotion. Uh, I, I, it's strange. There are people, though, who have achieved only that successfully, like John Philip Sousa. But because he didn't do anything else, it's hard to put it in perspective. That's all he did, patriotism. Debussy, who wrote this huge palette of emotional and, and intellectual ideas, in his palette, patriotism is jarring. But here you'll hear some patriotism. You will hear uh, the enemy coming as a Lutheran hymn for which he was criticized. People mean, why did you put that Lutheran hymn in there? Are you for the Germans? OK. And then uh, you will hear this at some point, or you won't hear, the Marseillaise, but I'll point it out to you. <laughs> Actually, I better tell you what it is, otherwise you'll never, ever hear it. This is it. You would not know that, but if you go. But he does this. That's it. In fact, nobody recognized it until he wrote in a letter that the Marseillaise is dead. <laughs> <coughs> then everybody found it. OK, so here's a little bit of this, this music. This is from a performance of the Chamber Music Society with a few years back with Anne-Marie McDermott and Lee Luvisi.
cannons rolling. It's like a movie score. Yes. Does it again? And victory is around the corner as page the page is turned by fate. It's impossible to hear that piece without putting it in context to, to actually appreciate it, unlike a lot of his other music. Each movement is dedicated to a friend who was killed in the war. Um, <clears throat> but even though it is very different from his music generally and is essentially programmatic and therefore has a, a, the possibility of being impressionistic because it is based on images, sonic images, like the rumbling, you know, it's programmatic meaning drums, bugle calls, and those things are like bird calls, which are not in this piece, but with Messiaen and other composers, those things relate to something outside of music. And because of that, uh, it can be somewhat impressionistic. Even with the detail, though, uh, every little thing in this piece is as thought out as in his masterpieces. And, I mean, this is a beautifully written piece. There's a big chord that you heard when things are looking good for the French. <laughs> This chord is a ninth chord, big, fat, dominant ninth. But when things are not looking good at the beginning, he does this chord. <laughs> it's kind of obvious, but that chord is related to the other one. They are both, this one he flatted the fifth and added a minor ninth and kept the fifth. It's the same chord. So this incredibly dissonant sound, which by the way, it's for two pianos, that's why I have to go like this. When the German element is expunged from the harmony, you get a pure ninth chord. And you get, okay? so that he actually was using the language he developed literally to portray the trouble and the triumph, or the trials and the triumph of, of the notes. <coughs> in the notes, I should say. Um, every little thing in here has, almost everything Debussy did gave an entire way of composing to, to the next few generations. Um, even musical comedies uh, in America owe a lot to both Debussy and Ravel for the whole sound world of it. In fact, um, if you think of something like the Fantastics, if you know that piece, um, without Debussy, you wouldn't have it. Here's the opening of uh, the same piece, first movement.
the freedom of the textures and, the, and all these um, unresolved but beautiful harmonies. Now we accept them. They're part of the jazz world. They are part of, uh, as I said, musical comedy. But they're part of not only a pop music that mostly is not being written anymore. I mean, it's, it's mostly contemporaneous with Ravel. That the, and then, uh, of course, musical theater in America, harmonically, is usually 50 to 80 years behind some European composer, which is fine. I mean, in other words, Richard Rogers is Brahms, uh, simplified. Uh, <laughs> And, and the people who come in the 60s are looking more at Debussy, you know, uh, almost 100 years. Well, not 100 years, so 60 years later. <clears throat> um, and then, of course, I, I don't know where else to take that. But I mean, uh, I will tell you one neuroscience test I looked at recently. Rap uh, is not, does not register in the, right, in the hemisphere where music is registered. It's only, <laughs> only, in the, only where words are. So it makes sense. It's more like it's, if you think of it as theater and poetry, it goes there. And the music part of the brain does not respond. Um, but you know, it is words. Now, I mention that because you know, it's um, the tendency of popular culture, and this is often denied, is that it, it is very far behind the vocabulary of art culture, very far behind. But it sort of makes sense um, because everything is familiar by then. One of the great dilemmas. If you want to, uh, as, as a composer, I can tell you this, this very humorous dilemma to live in America. If you want to be in the classical, so-called classical word, which, world, which is a word that I don't think means anything exactly, uh, because you know, it was the 18th century. But anyway, uh, then you have to always write something that seems somehow fresh and new and not like any other piece. But if you're in the more popular world, you have to write something that sounds extremely familiar and like the stuff we already like. That doesn't mean that people don't break through quite, quite. But you're always caught between having to be extremely original, supposedly, and having to be definitely in a, 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 a way that's established. And yet they both morph. And the classical one moves much faster because people are trying to be innovative. And that's, that's, the, that's the MO, is to have new language, have a new style. And then once that gets established, then the more popular styles can say, I'll take that. Um, I've heard jazz pianists even today, recently, who are basically using a vocabulary that comes out of uh, Ravel. And one of them, a very fine pianist, suddenly started playing some Ravel, <laughs> like eight or nine bars of Ravel, which I thought meant that he was thinking, if there's any musicians in the audience, here's some Ravel, and then I'll get right back to where I was. <laughs> which I thought was very, very entertaining, actually. Um, <clears throat> here's another piece. Uh, from the, Debussy, the last prelude of Debussy, Fireworks, d'artifice, in which he quotes the Marseillaise again for different reasons, because it has to do with fireworks. <laughs> And this is all it is. Near the end of Debussy's life, when he, you know, one of the first people in the world to have a colonoscopy, didn't work. But um, you probably didn't expect to hear that bit of information. <laughs> <laughs> but I prepare. <laughs> so so uh, anyway, he, um, he started to sign all his music, French composer, after his name. And actually, musician, musicien français, because he wanted to make it clear that he was and that being French mattered to him, which was not something that was on his mind for most of his life that way. But it was in a certain way, because when Debussy was young and, and when he was a student at that Paris conservatory with Guiraud and all these other people, the biggest problem they had was that German music was played more than French music. And that the, the, the canon was German. Beethoven still ruled. Um, Debussy felt that Beethoven was an extremely talented composer with a, who occasionally had bad taste. <laughs> um, which he also said of Liszt. Of course, the difference between Beethoven and Liszt is enormous. But he put them both in the category of composers who occasionally had bad taste. Debussy's favorite composers were Robert Schumann 
and Chopin and Mozart. Um, <clears throat> and what you get by linking Schumann, Chopin, and Mozart is a delicacy and a clarity, but also, especially in Chopin and Schumann, harmonic innovation. That there's always a sense of new in the harmony. Uh, Mozart, it was more for him the textures and the structures being so good it could have been French. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Chopin came to live in Paris. Schumann didn't, but uh, he should have. <laughs> so, next week we're going to hear and we will have uh, playing for us the sonata for flute, viola, and harp, one of his great masterpieces written near the end of his life as part of his project of six sonatas, six sonatas. Um, that were all by the musician Francais. He didn't finish them all, but, and this is one of the most extraordinary. And we'll listen, be able to hear it and examine what we already now know about Debussy's language to see how this creates a new piece. And the one thing I didn't say at all to prepare you for that, that piece is that aside from being innovative in all these ways, he also looked back to the Baroque. He was very much inspired by uh, the French Baroque. But as your last parting moment. You thought you were done. He also looked back to the Renaissance. And one of the pieces that inspired him when he wrote these war pieces was a vocal work called La Guerre by Jean Quint, uh, written in the um, early 17th century. I'll play you a little part of it here. It's all voices. But it was the idea that a great composer, and this was a great Renaissance composer, could write something about war and be kind of literal. Here is an impressionist vocal work from the Renaissance. Whoops, no, that is not it. That's the same piece, here we go. Whoops, wait, my finger is touching everything. Here we go. <laughs> see that this, uh, back there in the 16, uh, early 1600s, here's a composer imitating war, and actually they're making sounds just like a, a lot of people do now. You know, it's just, because when you, if you're singing and you only have your voice, of course you will come up with those things. Nothing is really new. But there you have um, something that inspired Debussy to include drums, cannons, and bugles going back. Because he felt one way to make French music great and new was to go back to the earliest French music. So we went back to French Renaissance, French Baroque in order to reinvigorate and combat German hegemony. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Good night.